One of the biggest issues with confused modern practitioners is that they are logically unable to separate matter from consciousness. Most people have a very flawed understanding of spirituality because they attribute spiritual things to material things. Now, those of you who have taken this course understand the law of correspondence at this point. I've gone through that thoroughly many times. And basically, we come to understand that we use the law of correspondence so that certain things can become representations, links, and triggers to an aspect of consciousness. So what that means is the candle doesn't have power. The stones don't have power. Your book, the tools, the sword, the robe, these things are not inherently magical. But it's the correspondence of the magician, of the magus, of the goes, that activates these objects so that they can be used. But the power does not come from these things. They're only representations. There's a lot of talk about divine masculine and divine feminine. And I've found through my many, many, many consultations, conversations, and emails and DMs that most people can't seem to grasp that divine feminine does not mean woman and divine masculine does not mean man now the energy of the divine feminine does come through uh, very profoundly through feminine entities feminine creatures but feminine energy exists without a body without a feminine body at all because these things we're dealing with they're etheric they're astral they're mental and they're spiritual they're not material. The material plane is the final plane to receive the influence of all these other planes. So please, please, please keep in mind, this is why I continue to say the law of correspondence, the principle of correspondence is the most important law, most important principle when dealing with magic. You've got to understand there's a separation between matter and consciousness. Otherwise, you will get confused. Most people believe that matter <laughs> is the magic. But matter is the laboratory. The magic itself is consciousness. And consciousness moves through matter through the agency of prana. The ancients called it prana. Now, modern day people, we call it energy. We call it vibes. We call it whatever, ether. The ancients called it prana. And this is the medium through which consciousness moves through matter. Because ultimately, all of matter is the same substance. There's no matter that's more special than the next. So this goes for skin tone and, and uh, DNA, right? There's, there's some people who say that you've got to be of a certain race or a certain bloodline or a certain genetic. Well, see, this, this cannot be true. Because again, matter is not consciousness. Consciousness is above and beyond matter. So it's not limited to your race and bloodline. It's not limited to your gender, right? There's some people who will say, oh, well, the woman is God. The black woman is God, right? And there's different things like that, which is also foolish because how can, an, how can matter be consciousness? Consciousness, matter is an aspect of consciousness, but it is not consciousness in its totality. So when I say consciousness, you can think of the highest spiritual substance or the highest spiritual stuff that exists. That's, that's, that's what the ancients called it. That's my word for it. Sometimes it's called Shiva. Sometimes it's called... There's, there's a lot of different names. It all depends on what pantheon or what culture or what practice you follow. The names are not important. It's the concept that matters. So all that being said, this video is about altars. So when we talk about doing rituals and whatnot, we've all heard of altars. And you may picture this very fancy tabletop thing with a cloth and pretty candles and skulls and rose petals and crystals and all types of stuff. And that there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but those things don't specifically make it an altar. To be truthful, even as Arius said in his videos in um, the Corporeal 
Chaos Consulting module. Every flat surface is an altar. Really. See, the same way that cavemen and primitive cultures sat around the campfire and gazed into it and channeled information from beyond, that hasn't changed because people still have that altar in the living room with the television set and, and the sound system and you spend hours gazing into that black screen that's sitting upon the altar. That's your altar for entertainment. Your bed is an altar. It's your altar for rest, right? If you go into the kitchen, you've probably got a selection of items there. Maybe your coffee machine and your blender and your, your pretty knife rack. That's your altar for, for cooking. And that's your altar for your breakfast routine, your dinner routine, your lunch routine. Even the refrigerator is an altar. Right? So look, it's not the thing itself, but it's what it symbolizes. So likewise, when we have an altar for spiritual work, an altar for the ancestors or whatever, this is a symbolic connection to the prana, to the energy that we're working with. So a lot of people, including myself, have an ancestor altar where you've got an actual... It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a cabinet, dresser, bookshelf... It, it doesn't matter, but I've, I've got a ancestor altar and on my ancestor altar, I have the pictures of family members, both living and deceased. OK, and I've got certain symbols that represent what some of those family members enjoyed while they were alive. And also some of the closest representations that I could find of, of what they represent to me. So you'll find the pictures, you'll find different items, you'll find different herbs and flowers and things like that because what this is it's a concentration of a concept whenever i see the altar or i pass by it in my periphery all of those objects are a concentration of a concept and in this case the concept is this familial uh connection this heritage this bloodline this concept that there were an infinite number of people who came before me to make life easier for me than it was for them right if for nothing else they gave me their best genetics so that i may be the best version of what this family represents so when i talk about an ancestor altar i'm not here to tell you to put a specific thing on there right uh ancestor money or, or whatever what i'm saying is that this is a symbolic representation of a concept so that means whatever works for you however it's going to work for you i've got other altars like a, a goetic altar dedicated to the particular spirits that i'm working with and of course you'll find the goetic sigils you'll find um i have these these figures these toys that represent the certain spirits that i work with and i have them on the altar and again they rep this all collectively represents a, a concentrated concept again even I said your bed is an altar especially if you're doing dream work and astral projection work the bed has now become an altar for energy so understand that you've already got altars all over your home instead of me telling you how to make an altar I want you to look around and identify the altars that you do have and what they represent you've probably got a desk with your computer and if all you do is watch porn, well, there's your altar for erotic feelings, right? Again, I talked about the kitchen countertop, the television, um, the kitchen table, different bookcases and bookshelves. Some people don't have bookshelves. They have a, a DVD case, right? A whole shelf full of different DVDs. Well, that's an altar. That's a shrine as well. It represents a concept. And if one was able to focus on it during meditative work there's a large number of things that may be able to be pulled from that so that's what i have to say about altars if you want some more information you can check out a youtube video that i did about altars a few years ago that's still very relevant the link is actually below so identify your altars that you currently have and it wouldn't be a bad idea to create a fresh one especially for the spirit that you choose to work with 
Now, as a side note, I've also got a lot of emails in the past about younger people or people who live with family members who don't approve of their practice. And they ask, you know, well, how can I have an altar if my family is Christian or we, we simply don't believe in that? How, how can I still operate magic? Well, here's the thing. The altar doesn't have to be physical. You know, even your body is an altar. But truly, if, if you need this space, there's, there's two ways that I could also suggest you do this. Number one, you could close your eyes and go within and build an altar yourself that can be yours personally, that no one ever has to see. Number two, the second, well, three options, really. The second option is you can use your phone. You can maybe get a Pinterest image board or something like that, maybe a folder full of specific images, and maybe you can glance through it uh, whenever you need to feel the connection to that concept, right? Now, the third way is maybe you can have a private space like a closet or even the corner. See, no one has to know that this is an altar and it doesn't have to be grand and obvious. You could literally just use a small space, a little corner on the side of your room or your office desk or even your locker. It doesn't have to be extravagant. All it has to do is represent a symbolic concept 